So are you ready to be transported out of this world? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, imagine that you were able to step into a time machine and go back far, far back in time to a time and place where the solar system was not even existing at the time. Place in the galaxy near a massive star that's about to go supernova. Imagine this is about five billion years ago. So you see the supernova going off from a safe distance, of course, and it releases the energy equivalent of something like quadrillions upon quadrillions of nuclear bombs. And the shock wave that goes out, it compresses some of the interstellar gas and dust that's nearby, and it triggers the formation of new stars. One of these new stars is our very own star, the sun. And now imagine that you're looking at the swirling cloud of gas and dust around our newborn sun. And you look closely, and it's cooling down slowly, and you start to form the very first solids, the first millimeter, centimeter sized solids from this cloud of gas and dust. And these little pebbles that are forming, they collect together, they stick together, they form these little rocks, and then those stick together, they form these boulders, and the boulders stick together to form asteroids, and the asteroids accumulate together to form planets like the Earth. So, if you were to grab a little bit of the earliest pebbles that were forming in that environment, squish them together, put them in a bag, and bring them in that time machine back to the present day, what might that look like? This is exactly what it would look like. And this is a meteorite. So meteorites really are the remnants from that earliest phase of the earliest history of our solar system. They are, in fact, our time machine to be able to go back in time and look at that space and time when our solar system was just starting to form. I'm going to step back just a little bit and, and talk about what a meteorite really is. These are rocky or metal-rich objects that come from elsewhere in our solar system. Most of them have traveled billions of miles in interplanetary space before they've fallen on the Earth. And they've survived passage through the Earth's atmosphere. And they fall on the surface and can be recovered. So that's meteorites. Now, what my goal is in this talk is to essentially convince you that meteorites are not just some oddball, rare phenomena. They are fundamental to our understanding of our past and of our future. My work, which I'm, I'm really passionate about, um, it basically involves fi figuring out uh, clever ways of decoding the information that's encoded in the chemical, chemicals that make up these rocks. And we're doing that um, in my laboratory by looking at the different components that make up these materials and trying to learn something about when they formed and how they formed. So what I'm going to do today, there's so much wealth of information that we've garnered from, uh, from meteorites that it would be impossible to cover that in the, in the space of 15 minutes here. What I'm going to do, though, is to condense that down to five essentials, five things that anybody who cares about the future of our planet, anybody who is curious about our past, uh, should know about meteorites. So the number one thing is that meteorites tell us that the age of our solar system is 4.5679 plus minus 0 0.0003 billion years old. How do we know that age? This is actually measured in my laboratory using radioactive elements that we use as clocks in these meteorites. This is almost like figuring out the age of a middle-aged man to um, within a day. So you can exactly, precisely determine exactly the day, the month, the year that this person was born to within a day. So this is an extremely precise age, but it matters. We need to know exactly what the context is for all of the events that happened 
following the formation of our solar system. And this is the age that gives us that, gives us that context for the timeline of everything else that's happened in our solar system following the initial formation, like the formation of the planets, formation of the Earth and the moon, the origin of life in our planet. Number two, there are materials preserved in meteorites, little tiny dust grains that are older than our solar system. So this little vial that you see here that's got this cloudy material in the bottom, these are billions upon billions of tiny diamonds that condensed in the atmospheres of other stars before the sun was even born. By looking at the chemistry of these little tiny grains, we can learn something about the evolution of the galaxy before the sun was even born. Very cool. So you think that meteorites are rare? Well, think again, because you're actually standing on a planet that's a huge agglomeration of a ton of meteorites, or more than a ton of meteorites, really. Um, meteorites, you can think of them as the Lego building blocks of planets like the Earth and the Moon. This actually is a picture of actually multiple images that were taken by uh, NASA uh, spacecraft called the Deep Space Climate Observatory. I love these images. Uh, they're some of the best selfies of our, of our home planet. Um, and you can see the moon moving in front of the Earth here. And it looks very serene, but this is nothing like what our planet looked like four and a half billion ago, years ago when it was just starting to form after the formation of our solar system. It was forming by the agglomeration of giant meteorites coming together to form, form our planet. And this process was so energetic that the entire surface of our planet at the time was covered with, with an ocean of magma. And as the Earth gradually was cooling down, uh, there was another huge impact of a Mars-sized meteorite that crashed into the Earth ejected this debris into orbit around the Earth, and we think that the Moon actually formed from a coalescence of that debris that was surrounding the Earth. And so meteorites really are essential to understanding the origin of the Earth and the Moon. Number four, meteorites likely brought the raw materials for life to the early Earth. So this is not just organic compounds like the amino acids that were brought in by some of the types of meteorites that we have in our collections, but also uh, bioessential elements like phosphorus that were brought in by meteorites and eventually uh, led to the type of chemistry that was required to take us from, from the chemistry to life. And so the reason why you and I are here today could very well be because of the material that was seeded to the early Earth by meteorites. And number five, meteorites have changed the course of the evolution of life on our own planet. And as you all, well, most of you probably know that 65 million years ago, there was a large bolide, something like 10 kilometers or six miles in diameter, that crashed into the Yucatan Basin. And it resulted in the extinction of more than three quarters of all species on the Earth, including the dinosaurs. So that particular event, that extinction event, was also important because that's what led to the possibility of uh, small, warm-blooded mammals to flourish and eventually it made the way for humans to be able to exist here. And that's the reason why you and I are, are here in this place in this time. So that's, that's amazing, right? So meteorites, five ways in which really they define our past and the course of evolution of life, origin and evolution of life on our planet. What about the future? Well, our cosmic neighborhood is teeming with asteroids. These red, yellow, and green dots that are shown here in this visualization, they're showing all of the known, meteor known asteroids at the current time. And most of these are larger than about a kilometer. There are about hundreds of thousands of other smaller asteroids out there that we've not even detected yet. So these smaller asteroids are probably not going to cause the type of glo global catastrophe that killed off the dinosaurs, but they're probably enough to cause a lot of death and destruction if they were to hit a large populated area. And just to sort of make that point, 
Um, more, many of you have probably been up to Meteor Crater up in northern Arizona. And that was actually created by an object that's, about, that's estimated to be about 100 feet in diameter. And it created a crater that's about a mile wide. So this is an event that happened about 50,000 years ago now. And at the time when this happened, the energy that it deposited was the equivalent of something like 150 atom bombs. And so the, you can imagine the type of destruction to plant life and animal life that happened in this part of the continent as a result of that impact. And that could be devastating for any large city if it were to happen today. Now that event happened 50,000 years ago. And the probability we estimate for uh, an impact that size, 100 feet or so in diameter, uh, to happen is it's estimated to be once every 50 to 100,000 years. So that's something we're basically due for another one. Uh, it could happen next month, or it could happen 50,000 years from now. But it's not a question of if, it's a matter of when there's going to be a large asteroid that's going to be on a collision course to the Earth. And so what are we going to do about it? So of all of the natural hazards that we know about, asteroid collision is the one that could essentially wipe out our species, but it's also the one that is imminently preventable. How are we going to prevent it? Well, there's two, two ways that we, well, actually there's two things that we have to do. It's not one or the other. We have to be studying meteorites, we have to be studying asteroids to understand their chemistry, their structure. Uh, we have to be looking at the, how the orbits of these asteroids evolve. And all of these pieces of information will be necessary to develop the strategies to redirect asteroids that might be headed on a collision course to the Earth. And then, of course, we have to also inspire the next generation of, uh, of children, of kids, to be willing to invest in the future and to be good stewards of our home planet. So, we are actually doing all of these things. Um, we're studying meteorites, we're studying asteroids, trying to understand what we can about their composition, about their structure. We're also using space rocks to inspire kids of all ages. And it's actually kind of a, a wonderful thing. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, where you see a 10-year-old when, they, when they're totally enthralled with something. I've seen these kids that when you give them the space rock to hold in their hand, they are completely awe-inspired, just knowing that they're holding something in their hand that is older than the Earth. That's the oldest rock in the solar system. It's an amazing thing to watch. And I want to be able to use that same inspiration to excite or spark an interest in STEM fields, basically science, technology, engineering, math. So using space rocks as a vehicle for, for inspiring that kind of interest. Um, how are we going to do that? Well, we've been doing that locally um, for many, many years, but what we'd like to do is to extend that globally. And we're doing, hoping to do that by taking kids on a virtual field trip of the solar system. And how we're going to do that is we're going to create an immersive virtual environment. And this is something that the Center for Meteorite Studies is collaborating with the Center for um, Education Through Exploration here at ASU. And we are developing this immersive environment where you'll be able to walk into the vault of our meteorite collection. You'll be able to go to any one of the drawers and open them up. And we have the 3D color laser scans of all of our meteorites that you can basically pick up a meteorite from a drawer and look at it in three dimensions to experience it as a three-dimensional object. There'll be embedded videos that'll provide information about the samples and what we're learning from these types of materials. And so we'd like to be able to make this really exciting for kids to be able to explore places in the solar system where they may some, someday hope to go, perhaps. And maybe they will never be able to go, but they will be able to vicariously go there through looking at these rocks. They'll actually get to be geologists studying rocks on other worlds. They'll be able to go to places like this primitive asteroid, like this asteroid Itakawa, and Look, by looking at rocks like this one, which we think come from asteroids like this. They'll be able to visit the asteroid Vesta. This is the second largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. And we think that this is actually a small planet which underwent complete melting early in the history of the solar system, such that 
uh, the, all of the iron nickel metal sank to the core and you have a dense mantle and a lighter crust just like the structure of the earth. And in fact, we have meteorites in our collections that come from the crust of this very asteroid. There's a large impact basin in the southern part of this asteroid which was uh, studied quite well actually by a NASA spacecraft called Dawn. And we now know that these types of meteorites that we have in our collections come from this very asteroid. And so we'll be able to explore the geology of this one asteroid by looking at these things. And then, of course, there are meteorites that we know come from the moon. And so we'll be able to explore, the kids will be able to explore the geology of the moon by looking at rocks like this one, which we believe comes from the highland part, highland, highlands of the moon. And then finally, there's not been a sample return, a spacecraft that's gone to Mars and brought back samples, but we've got these free samples from Mars. These are meteorites that come from Mars, and this is an example of one that comes from an area on Mars that had volcanism happening on it um, about 200 million years ago. So this is a relatively young rock that's coming from the surface of Mars. You'll be able to do geology by looking at these, these samples and trying to understand the history of that planet through these rocks. And so the goal really for us is to try to make it really exciting for kids uh, to study these space rocks, to, to basically um, learn something about places where these rocks come from, to explore the solar system through them, to be inspired by, by looking at these, uh, by trying to understand the environments where they form. And we want to inspire them to be curious about not just the planet that they live on, but the solar system and the universe that they inhabit and to recognize that for the first time in the history of this planet, there's a species that inhabits our planet, our, us human beings, that have the capacity to actually do something about an asteroid that might be on a collision course to the Earth. So I believe that we can use space rocks as a means of inspiring kids to recognize that the future is what we, can, what we choose to make it. Thank you.